Yeah, we're live. It's 7.04, a couple of minutes late, but that's what happens. We get lots of stuff to do. Lots of stuff to talk about tonight. One is the thumbnail that I put up is an air water intercooler. Now, we, I, we normally run that on the dyno because it works very well. And for the dyno use, it's really easy rather than having set up gigantic fans and ducting and because you know, here's the thing that happens having run a number of air to water versus air to air intercoolers the just like with anything else you get proponents of both sides so i get to hear about the people that are mad at me when i do a test like that because i didn't give the thing that they love obviously the fair shake especially if it turns out that it didn't do as well now i've run air to water versus air to air intercoolers a number of times and Quite honestly, in the range that we're running them at, they both work equally well. And we've talked about this before on the live feed. If I was choosing one of those, it wouldn't be because I think one works better than the other. There's not, what's the best intercooler, Richard? <laughs> it's not so about being the best. What works is what's best for your application. And I've, we've talked about this, like on a road race car, I would have an air to air because you have lots of airspeed, especially like when we ran the Silver State, you know, we might be going 200 miles an hour. So you have lots of airspeed. You can get that going through there, and you and you have a constant source of air. You can have constant cooling. If you want the ultimate thing, like the maximum cooling, the lowest charge temperature that you could possibly get, then you use a transfer medium in the cooler that's lower than whatever the air, you know, lower than even than ambient. So if we're using ambient air to cool it, the very most that we could ever get the thing down to is ambient. You won't normally do that on an air to air, especially at high boost stuff. What you're going to do is instead of being 300 or 400, now it's going to be 100, which which is going to be a lot better. With with an air to water, you can use ice water, which we've used many times, or even water, ambient water, or something colder than ambient water, which helps with the cooling. The if you use ice water, you're talking about something that's 32 degrees. So if you're, you know, you have two or 300 or 400 degree charge temperature going across 32 degrees, it's going to cool it lower than it does when you just have the air, ambient air trying to cool it. The problem with that is for a lot of guys, the the weight is an issue because when you when you have an air to water setup, you don't just have the air to water intercooler. You also have to have the water. And so the water is fairly heavy. You have pumps, you have a secondary heat exchanger, you have a big reservoir full of water, you know, which we run and pack full of ice when we were running this up like at Bonneville. At Bonneville, it's not an issue because you actually want a bunch of extra weight. It helps keep the car on the ground. And, and a lot of guys add weight to Bonneville cars anyway to keep them, to help them get traction and stuff. We didn't have to do that to get traction on our front wheel drive car, but we weren't that concerned about weight because once you get going a certain speed, the weight of the vehicle is a whole bunch less important than the aero of the, because you get up to a certain speed and basically it's the horsepower versus the aerodynamics of the vehicle. So an air to water intercooler works very, very well for that. I ran an air to water intercooler in my Chevy Sprint Turbo on the street and it worked great. Um, again, but you, you like with the air to air, you could never get the thing down below ambient because you're using ambient air to cool the water. And most of the time you're not in boost. You don't have really hot air going through it. All you have is the air that's associated with the temperature of the engine compartment, which the cooler is in there. And in our case, the water was also in there. We had it in a plastic, like one or two gallon um, fuel jug that we just bought at the local store because we put that on there and made it work. And, you know, in typical Richie fashion, did bungee cords and tape and stuff to hold it in place when we were running that at the Maxton mile and setting land speed records with it. So you can't set land speed records with plastic fuel jugs. But all that stuff is gonna mean that you can't get it any colder basically than ambient. Now, in our setup, that air to water intercooler worked way better than the factory air to air, mostly because the factory air to air was not a big front mount in front of the radiator, getting lots and lots of at least ambient air. It was mounted in the engine compartment with a ducting going to it over the radiator and then down. But the problem is that in those kinds of situations, like you have to have a lot of pressurized air to go into the intercooler because in the engine compartment, that's a pressurized air source. So it's hard to get air to flow across that and it didn't flow very well and the intercooler was not sized very well. I mean, it's sized okay for a 70 horsepower motor, but once we started doubling the power output of the motor, the air to water intercooler made it a, a lot better and lower the charge temperature much more than the air to air because I did a lot of data logging and testing and you know, top speed stuff. And we did a lot of power runs with that thing. But the thing is, 
with an air and air or an air and water, the question isn't which one of those is best. They both work, and we've talked about that. They both work for different applications. And so the, which one you would choose, you choose for your car and the placement and fitting and what you're going to be using it for and all that stuff. The question is, does the intercooler actually work? And we know in, in one sense, it absolutely does work. I, we've measured drops in charge temperature many, many times. With, it, with whatever, even a bad intercooler works fairly well. It, it, it will definitely lower the charge temperature. If you, if you have, let's say, 100 degree ambient air and you're running boost and you're running 7 pounds, 10 pounds, 14 pounds, 20 pounds, whatever it is, you're going to have a good 100 or 200 or more um, degrees from your turbo or supercharger on top of whatever the ambient is. So you're going to have hot air. And then running an intercooler cools that back down. And the nice thing is that helps reduce the chance of detonation, and which is obviously a good thing, especially and becomes even more critical if you're running stuff on pump gas. If you've got E85, you get the extra cooling, you've got the extra octane, that becomes less of an issue. But the motor will be always be much happier if you do have an intercooler. Even guys that are running E85, even methanol guys, uh, most of the guys that choose not to have an intercooler with methanol is not so much because they know that the intercooler, because they've already cooling it enough with methanol, which is not true. You'll have a cooler charge temperature with an air to air intercooler, um, but they don't do it for the weight. Like if you're drag racing and you're running a methanol car, you're running, you know, a, a million, you want the, a million horse car and you want the car to be really light they don't like the balance between what the weight of the intercooler system, you know, with ice water and all that stuff, what, what the weight of that costs versus the gain, even if it's a net zero, they'd almost rather just have not have the weight. So my question is, and, and that's what, that's what we're talking about tonight is does an intercooler actually add power? So if we take a turbo setup, like let's say a turbo LS could be a turbo anything, and we run it non-intercooled and we run it with enough. And, and these are all the caveats that you have to have when you're discussing whether or not this stuff is actually functional, but whether or not it actually adds power. These are the things. You get, well, did, like, it's like saying, well, what, what is the best cam? Well, what, what are you doing? Is it a daily driver? Is it a street strip car? Is it a road race car? Is it a drag race car? You know, all of those things. You have to ask all these questions. So it's the same thing with does an intercooler add power? And here's what got me thinking about this. And and I was talking to somebody and trying to explain to them why boost controllers do what they do and why they don't do what they do. Um, he was under the assumption that uh, an electronic boost controller or a three port or a four port boost controller um, will actually make the turbo that you have come up a lot quicker. <laughs> and I tried to explain to him, I said, look, forget that you have a boost controller. Let's say that you don't have a wastegate. Let's say that we just cap that and you get into the throttle and the turbo comes up the way that the turbo comes up. That's a hundred percent response. You cannot with any kind of controller make it come up any faster than that. That the way that it comes up is a function of the power output of the naturally aspirated motor and then other things like the size of the turbo and the, you know the size of your piping, the amount of heat that you have into it, all these other things. But that have nothing to do with the controller. And he was absolutely convinced, I, I think because he didn't really understand how controllers work that if he was to put a controller on it and, and configure it the right way with the ports doing the right things and controlling the and holding the wastegate closed, I'm like, look, we're already holding the wastegate closed because there's no wastegate. It's not going to open because it, it's over sitting in the box. We just had the thing capped. That's all of it. The way that the turbo comes up is the way that the turbo is going to come up. And the only thing that you could ever hope to do with the controller is do that. But here's what made me think of intercooling when I was talking to him about this situation. That's this. If we are, if we take a turbocharged LS, let's say we're running 10 pounds and we're running it non-intercooled. We've got our you know, exhaust manifolds feeding a Y pipe like I do. You put a turbo on it, an S475 or a GT45 or whatever it is on a 48, and we run it, we run it at 10 pounds, we've got E85 in it, we've got 22 degrees of timing in it, we've got the air fuel is 11.8. It's got all the things that it needs. And it makes a given amount of power. And then we add an intercooler to it, an air to air or the air to water that we always run. And we bring the charge temperature down. You know, let's say we bring it down another 100 degrees or, you know, at 10 pounds, it might be a little more than that, it might be 150 degrees. So we bring that down 100 degrees. And my question is so I'm going to, we'll start our poll so that I don't forget about that. 
So the poll is, does an cooler Does an intercooler add power? Let's see what happens. And we'll see what happens after I make this discussion. So we have our turbo LS. We have our non-intercooled version. We run it at 10 pounds. We put an intercooler on it. We run it at 10 pounds. Are we going to have more power? The answer in, in all of my testing is it depends. <laughs> Usually it's yes. And but we need to talk about the reason why it's yes. And this is where boost controllers come in. This is where the, the electronic boost controller or any kind of controller comes in. And really more aptly, not so much a controller, but where are you taking your wastegate reference line from? So if you're taking your wastegate reference line from in the manifold, which is normally where I recommend, because like uh, as, as another side note, as another tangent on the sprint, the way that it was set up, it was set up with, you know, the, the turbo was drilled and tapped for fitting, like right on the, the outlet of the compressor housing. And then that's where the wastegate got, got its control from. So as soon as that thing saw, I think that the factory was like seven pounds. As soon as it saw seven pounds, the wastegate would open. Um, and then if we took and moved that reference line from where it was coming out of the turbo over to the intake manifold, all of a sudden we'd have another pound and a half of boost. Not because we changed the spring on the wastegate, not because we bled it or done any sort of adjustment. The only thing that's happened is we are now getting a reference from the intake manifold instead of right coming out of the turbo. And then whatever the boost is coming out of the turbo, there are going to be losses from that exit of that turbo to the length of tubing, the number of turns through the intercooler, definitely even by design, not, not so much that the intercooler is restrictive or that you lose boost, you lose boost by design through an intercooler. And the reason that is, is because we drop the temperature. If you drop the temperature by 100 degrees, the pressure is going to go down. So when you lose boost, a part of that is a good thing. If it's real restrictive and you have a big boost drop from either, you know, between either side of the core, some of that could be restriction. You want to minimize that. And that's the problem with an intercooler is that you're fighting this balance between maximum flow and maximum cooling. And oftentimes those two things are at odds. Now you can size your turbo and use a coolant of transfer medium where you could get the best of both worlds. That's, it's not hard. It just takes some doing. But remember I said, moving that reference line from where the turbo is to where the intake manifold is, changed the amount of boost that we got. So now think about this. We put our intercooler on and we have our boost reference at the manifold. And we run it again, we run it at 10 pounds. We run it at 10 pounds as registered in the intake manifold. So the same way that we ran it non-intercooled. But now we have an intercooler in the mix, which does two things. One, it obviously cools the charge temperature. That would bring the boost down. Also, it has, it's got to have some kind of restriction. Every intercooler is not 100% efficient and, and gets like doesn't have any pressure drop across it. We're going to have a little bit because of the temperature change. We're also going to have some because of just it's, it's in the way of flow, basically. So we're going to have a drop. So let's say that we dropped, I don't know, let's say we dropped a pound of boost going from the turbo to the intercooler. So we dropped a pound. So what happened now is when we put the intercooler in with our turbo and the reference line registering boost at the intake manifold, what the turbo did, and we would see this if we had a turbo tack, <laughs> if, we had, if, we know, if we knew the impeller speed, and really, if we had a mass air meter or an airflow meter for the airflow going into the turbo, we'd also know this. What happens is the turbo speeds up because now it still wants to make the same 10 pounds. It's going to make 10 pounds. It's going to keep spinning up until it makes that 10 pounds in the manifold. And then the wastegate's going to open and go, okay, we're at 10 pounds. I'm fine. Now it's made 10 pounds, but at a higher impeller speed and more flow through the turbo. So it's sped up to keep the boost the same, which begs the question, and I get this all the time, is boost a realistic, you know, comparative measurement when we're doing these tests? It's what everybody uses on the street, and that's why I use it. But, you know, a, a lot of guys might also want to see a test of, well, let's just make sure that the flow is the same. 
So here's how we're going to do that, or here's how we would do that on our test. So if we if we do that same test, now we're going to run it non-intercooled, 10 pounds on our LS, same turbo and everything. But we're going to take, we're going to put our reference line for the wastegate right at the turbo, right at the exit of the turbo, or on that little flange that they use. They, they have a little casting um, that you drill and tap into. Some of them are already done that have a, a pipe fitting in them. So if we take our boost reference line right there at the turbo. That's 10 pounds. So it's not 10 pounds in the manifold. It's just 10 pounds coming out of the turbo. And the manifold gets whatever it gets. So that's when the wastegate opens. So we're making a certain amount of power and we're running 10 pounds right there at the turbo. Now, a non-intercooler. Now we put our intercooler in the middle of all that. <laughs> so now the turbo is still making 10 pounds at the turbo. Now we're making even less boost in the manifold. In fact, because of the restriction in the manifold, it, the boost is going to back up and stack a little bit. So the reality is we'd probably be spinning the impeller slower now and drawing less air in than we did when we had it non-intercooled. And trust me, all of this stuff correlates out when, we, when I've done all the testing. But this is what happens. And this is why there's always the uh, fine print or me having to explain things and go off on tangents when they do these kinds of tests, because the results that we would get on those two situations would obviously be different. Because in one instance, we're, and, and I like the situation where we're getting the boost in the manifold. If we're going to use boost as a measurement, I think it should be in the manifold. But as I said, what's going to happen is the turbo is going to spool up faster. And we would also see this on supercharge applications. It doesn't do it automatically like the turbo does because the turbo is regulated by boost. So it artificially goes, hey, look, I'm spinning up until we make the boost. That's what I do. I'm you know, regulated by boost. That's how I roll. So until I get the boost, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing. With superchargers, it's a different thing. If we have a centrifugal blower or a roots blower or whatever, the, the boost applied by the supercharger is a function of the displacement and power output of the motor. A lot of guys don't realize it. Think they, they give me all these formulas like, oh, yeah, we can figure out what the boost is on this blower with, <laughs> with blower speed and, and uh, the displacement of the motor. I'm like, yeah, but the boost is going to be a lot different, even if the displacement is the same, because we could have a 400 horsepower 454, or we could have an 800 horsepower NA 454. And the displacement would stay the same, but I guarantee you that the boost is going to be a lot different, even if you're spinning the blower the same. Again, another tangent. But with a supercharger, things are a little bit different. It doesn't artificially spin itself up faster if you put an intercooler in. So if we run our Pro Charger or Torque Storm or Vortec or whatever, and we're blowing into our throttle body on our LS, and we're making 10 pounds, and we're taking our reference in the manifold, then we put an intercooler in and we're taking a reference in the manifold. What we're going to see is not the same boost. We're going to see it drop. The boost is going to drop because the blower now is blowing through an intercooler. But the thing is, the impeller speed is the same because the impeller, impeller, impeller speed of the supercharger is dictated by the crank pulley, the blower pulley, the internal step ratio of the supercharger. And so that's always going to be the same. <laughs> so based on how much boost it's producing, um, the airflow could change a little bit. And we would see that again, if we had a mass air meter or some sort of uh, flow meter in front of the supercharger, we would see that also. But we're gonna see a drop in boost in the manifold. And we're gonna see that no matter where we're taking our reference because the reference doesn't matter. It's not controlling boost. The blower speed and the, and the engine um, displacement and power output is controlling, dictating what the boost is. But we will see a drop there. So if we put an intercooler in on a supercharge application, sometimes we see a drop in power, whether it's a roots blower or a twin screw blower or, or a centrifugal blower, sometimes we see a gain. <laughs> so again, my question is, let's, we'll, see how our, we'll see how our poll is doing. We're saying, uh, does intercooler add power? 78% saying yes. I, I like them and always use them and recommend them. But again, the, my point was, especially on the turbo applications, it depends on where we're taking our measurement because we could make it show that it's possible that it doesn't add power. And we can also show that, oh yes, 100%, it always does add power. 
depending on where we're taking our reference from. So, and then you guys can argue, people and people will, they'll argue about where you should actually take that reference. Should it be based on something else? Oh, boost is just a restriction, a measurement of restriction, yada, 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 except that everybody has a restriction gauge on their turbo application because they have mounted inside their car because they want to see what their restriction is. Look, look at all their, look at all that restriction I've got. It's because that's cool. Um, so that's my discussion for today. I just want to see what you guys thought about intercoolers, whether or not they add power. Again, I 100% recommend them for every application. Yes, even on the 85. Yes, even on methanol. But again, guys and, and guys that are running methanol and that are running 2,000 or 2,500 horsepower deals are not listening to me anyways. They're, they're doing their own thing because they're, they're out there like doing it and racing and they're not listening to some guy on YouTube. Um, but for the other things, the centrifugal blowers and stuff, it's, it's an interesting deal because you'll, you'll definitely see a drop in boost. And when you see a drop in boost, <laughs> you, you'll see a drop in power unless you put a camshaft in. Then you'll see a drop in boost and you'll see an increase in power. So it, it can go either way. So let's see what you guys got going on for tonight. Uh, we have a we have a new subscriber. She actually just sent me her thing. Um, uh, a young lady that my son plays um, soccer with her son, and she's going to have some uh, Pontiac stuff for sale. So I'll be putting that up here. She's got a four speed trans, and it's an M twenty one or twenty two, I think. Um, so I'll let you guys know, and then some 6X heads and stuff and a, and a block. So if I've got anybody that's a, a, a Pontiac guy that's going to want stuff, I'll go ahead. I'm going to be listing that stuff for her so that, so that she can uh, get the money for it and sell it and, and uh, use it as she seems <laughs> as she needs. So it should work out good. Um, let's see what you guys got going on. Can you talk about blow through cooling? Um, that's another form of charge cooling, and it does work whether you're blowing through a carburetor you get the late heat of vaporization, you get um, cooler, it, it, it will cool the charge air. But even on a carbureted blow through application, I put intercoolers on those and still made power. So that's not the end all, it's just part of what you're doing. Uh, EA5 blow through carbs, intercooler or not, I, I would use them. I always recommend intercoolers on, on every application. One pass, M5, no intercooler. Yeah, a lot of guys don't use it with with uh, M1. I heard about somebody using a straight six three hundred Ford flywheel machine to bolt to a Cadillac crank with a shim starter and Ford Bendix. Why, why did they want to put a different flywheel on the Cadillac? Is it because the Cadillac? Uh, Motors are hard to find flywheels for because they didn't put them in a lot of manual transmission cars. Uh, 2.2, definitely intercooled, although we'll run it non-intercooled before we run it intercooled. Big difference between M21 and M22. Yeah, we've been through that. Dan, you, you've been missing for like a week. Actually, I have too. <laughs> what's your what's your take on the Vortec air to water intercoolers versus Pro Charger air to water, air to air? Any thoughts on why they haven't upgraded in the last 20 years? Are you talking about both of them haven't upgraded? Uh, we talked about air to air versus air to water as a universal thing. If you wanted to do a comparison between actual units then the units would be, are they big enough? Are they size big enough? And the the small after coolers from Vortec, like they use on the five liters and stuff, are fairly small, they're fairly restrictive. I've run some, uh, in fact, I have a video up on a couple of air to airs from Procharger where we did their big upgrade for the big air to air and it definitely made, um, and, and it definitely made more power. Yeah, Kevin's a good guy to listen to. He's got a lot of guys running the blow through stuff, and they work really well. Yes, we've got a we've got new digs. I'm I'm not done completely done yet, but it's working. Yeah, Dan, we we did move into a new house. Uh, 
Uh, Duke's Mopar Garage. I'm finally, I'm hoping to finally get my 5.9 Magnum. Spent a lot of time getting ready for more power. 276 cam. That's a good one. Port and polish heads. Good. Just started getting the nitro system installed. That'll make a difference. Uh, Dave, intercoolers do not add power. How does an intercooler add air to the engine? We maybe you weren't there during the whole discussion that we just had. <laughs> it's light. I'm in California. It's always sunny. It's always like 75. No, Casey, they'll never be 100% full. It'd be cool to have pictures of your race car. I do have some. I haven't taken them out. I've got pictures of, I have this. This is the best picture I have, though. Yeah, look at that. I painted that when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> uh, I copied your 565 and put a twin 88s on it. That's twin 88s is a lot of power. And I have I have some pictures of the Del Sol. And I also have pictures of the um, of the Civic as well. I don't know where the Civic is now. I think, oh, here we go. Here's the, that's the Bonneville Civic. Yeah, you know, you're all jealous. So we'll put some of that stuff up. Uh, no mustache. Trying to figure out how to intercool your draw through VW setup. The turbo is too close to the motor. I remember looking for a bell housing for the Cadillac, and it was not easy to find. Uh, Brian, yes, I was referencing Vortec not upgrading the restrictive air to water after the Pro Charger air to air came out. They have bigger ones, they have Mondo coolers. Yeah, Cameron, I didn't have um, it was more than just a move because I was would still do videos during the move, but we didn't have internet, unfortunately. <laughs> Color coded bookshelves. Hopefully, they'll all be organized much better than before. Turns into a fuel tank. The Cadillac um, bell housing is not the issue. Finding the Cadillac flywheel is an issue because that most of it, well, I think all of them came with automatics. I don't, uh, I, Tony, I don't know what the boost leash is. You'll have to explain that. I don't think I've ever used one. I was wondering if some LS pilot bearings will work in a 472. I don't know what the snout is on that, but it's pretty, they're pretty easy to drill out and make larger if you had to do that. Uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm not talking about in this intercooler test, I'm not talking about changing the timing. I'm talking about already having enough timing because we have enough octane in the fuel where the timing isn't the issue. Uh, what's the next dyno project? I don't know. I need to go back down to West Tech. Shout out in Manila. What's up, man? Just look at the difference in the Buick Grand National from 85 to 86. Intercoolers allow for more power. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good way. Uh, what boost controller? We run. We run a TC1 on there, which is an old one. But I talked to uh, my buddy at TurboSmart, and it looks like we might use one of his. Uh, 
uh, Jeff, the if you're thinking about in, in my opinion, water methanol is not a substitute for intercooling only because it doesn't have the distribution that I would want unless you did port. That being said, there are lots of guys out there that use it. I know I rode in Brian Tooley's like supercharged LS7 Corvette um, and he was running a, a water meth kit on it and through that long runner intake manifold. But the thing is, I just don't, after seeing the stuff that I saw in the engine dyno, it just scares me to to have not, the distribution not be optimum. Uh, so Dan, you were responsible for a rule change in NASCAR. Congratulations, that's good. Can you test David Visard's cam? ICA stuff on the dyno. Supposedly my small block Ford set up at 13 and what it heads with like a 106 intake center line. <laughs> One of the things that I wish David would do, and I need to have this conversation with him, is I wish that he would um, stop telling, stop doing videos and saying that the cam companies don't know what they're doing. He He's, and I love David, but he's not the only guy that understands camshafts. <laughs> And the guys that are at cam companies understand camshafts. Um, and, you know, I, I think going out and trying picking fights with those guys is not the way to go about it. Uh, how do I cal calculate cooler size for turbo size and engine displacement? It's not really based on engine displacement. It would be based on power output and boost level. What do you think of the sandwich air to water intercourse? They work good, but again, any cooler that you use, Whatever the core size is, whatever the cross section is, whatever the thickness is, whatever the flow rate is, and whatever the heat transfer ability is, all that stuff needs to be taken into consideration when you're trying to do it. There's no, like that design isn't better than a remote one or any of that. They all work and, and you just need to, it just needs, again, like we talked about, it needs to have the balance between cooling and airflow. Your pull should be, does an air core make the air charge more dense? What? Well, why should that be the pull? I think keeping it simple is probably a better idea. And the one thing with the intercoolers is that it, you, don't have, you don't really have to worry about it being too big. <laughs> Have you ever done a dyno test of Steve Morris's turbo cam in a big block? I haven't. I, I don't even know what the specs are or anything. I mean, Steve's a really sharp guy and he, he makes a million horsepower. So, uh, Brandon, hello all. Would an LS3 chew up lifters in less than 10,000 10, miles? The 10, yeah, 10,000 miles after a BTR cam kit with a. No, it shouldn't. If you look at when we go to the wrecking yard and get motors that have two or 300,000 miles on them, we still reuse those lifters, the stock ones. Yeah, Dan, the, the, like I said, Billy Godbold is, is a pretty sharp guy. And there's a lot of sharp guys that, that understand how to make power. Um, and I, I think that David is doing his, I think, I think his channel would do better if he didn't take that approach. Uh oh, we have an intercooler after cooler guy here. <laughs> Intercoolers between the two turbos. I've read the books also, but intercooler is the, is the current usage. Have you... Uh, racing, forgive me, but have you done a twin screw versus turbo to see which one has a flatter torque curve? Yes, uh, that I did the twin screw roots, centripetal, and turbos on the modular Ford. I also did turbo and twin screw. That wasn't part of it on the five liter, though. Uh, turbo versus roots versus centripetal on the five liter, and then turbo centripetal versus roots on the on the um, b16 honda so the only one that has but a but a twin screw is not going to give you necessarily a flat torque curve 
by design. I mean, the, the torque curve all, is also going to be a function of the motor and the camshaft and stuff. Dodge used your idea to use AC evaporators. <laughs> I would imagine that that's been around a long time. Steve Morris cam, 272 duration, 742, 742. There's nothing special about that camshaft that's... Uh, uh, if it's a single pattern cam, I would wonder why he he was doing that. But like I said, he, he, he makes lots of power. So would you recommend CDDP oil with an LS cam swap? Not necessarily. That stuff really is more for, um, is more for lifters. And you don't really have to worry about that with a, a hydraulic roller lifter. Randall, in our testing, just an inner core does not actually provide a noticeable horsepower unless you keep the boost level corrected. Well, we did. We went through that whole discussion about where the boost reference we were, we were taking it from. You Maybe you weren't here in the beginning. People that argue about esoteric stuff. That's like the motor engine thing, too. I get that comment all the time. You know better than that. You know that only electric motors are motors and only internal combustion engines are engines. And then, the, then the, I always tell them that I'm going to call the Ford engine company or general, general engines, and then they get mad about that. You need a supercharged V8s of some kind in the background of the office. So I need to have an engine on an engine stand up here. I'd have to bring it up a, a few things at a time. I don't know if the floor would withstand that. Uh, what's the longest stroke crankshaft you can put in a six liter before clearance issues? Yeah, it's you're not going to run into clearance issues as much as you're because you're going to have to clearance the things on the the bottom of the of the cylinder bore. But also you're going to run into issues of pulling the piston out of the bottom of a hole and having it get all wonky at the bottom. So a four inch crank is what I recommend. You don't go bigger than on a factory six liter LS block or, or any of the factory blocks except the LS7 block. Um, I don't know if the aluminum LS3 blocks have a longer sleeve in them. I don't, maybe they do. But the aftermarket blocks have longer sleeves in them so that we've run four to 50 stroke cranks in those on a dart and sleeve block or, or an aftermarket block. We ran a four 500 stroke crank in a tall deck RHS block and that worked really well. It made uh, 495 inches or something. Yeah, Randall, we were talking about having the boost reference line in the intake manifold versus at the turbo and then doing an intercooler test in those two configurations and then what the difference would be. And also intercooler testing with a supercharger where it's not regulating, uh, where it's not changing the impeller speed, you know, and the airflow basically based on that um, wastegate reference line position. Richard, why would lifters fail after only 50,000 miles after a cam kit? Should I have changed the lifters too during the cam kit? Um, I don't know. Do, do, you have the, do you have the lifter preload correct? Are you over revving it? Um, a, a lot of things can happen with the cam choice. Um, I don't know who's, I don't, you, maybe you mentioned whose cam you have, but the, um, the running against the limiter is bad, uh, will hurt lifters. Um, the valve train, the camshaft, if it's not stable at RPM, can hurt the lifters. Have you tried using nitrous as a cooling effect? Yeah, Darren, there's a video up where I use nitrous as the intercooler and also use nitrous with the intercooler ring that you use that you put on an air-to-air -air intercooler and blowing nitrous through the air-to-air -air intercooler, neither of which is very good. Nitrous as a cooling agent in the intake, even though it's negative 129 degrees, the problem is if you add 100 horsepower with the nitrous to a turbo motor that's already making 800 horsepower, the amount of negative 120 degree stuff compared to the amount of hot 
800 or 800 horsepower stuff is it's just not enough to have a cooling effect basically it seemed to cool the charge temperature by about 30 or 35 degrees so it's not very much but it did add a lot of power i've heard people run with no radiator or intercooler you can a lot of guys use billet blocks where they don't have water going through them and if you just start it up and heat it up and make the run it doesn't heat up enough for that i put a four inch stroke on a six liter yeah that works good that's the biggest one that i would recommend You can actually make a 520 inch LS, but um, again, if you're taking everything to the limit, which I, we didn't want to do because we wanted to be able to have, we want to be able to go up, um, you know, we will only did a 4185 bore and I think that the block would go to 4200. Please elaborate on how to get 468 inches from an aluminum LS1. We did it with an LS6 aluminum block, but we sleeved it. So we put um, Darton sleeves in it, which would allow us to go to a much bigger bore. And then we put a 4250 stroke crank in it. And I think, if I remember right, I think that that one was also a 4185 bore. Yeah, Terry, that's a good question. On um, the guy that broke your lifters or whatever, did they rotate in the bore? Does that what, is that what broke? Did it hurt the cam or did the lifters go out? If they didn't rotate, then um, chances are it could be valve train instability or something. Too much spring pressure. Yeah, you can overspring your camshaft, definitely. Semi oval the sleeve. I'd like to re-sleeve it and make 468 inches. Yeah, the 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 nice thing about the sleeves, like the dart and stuff, is like I said, it, it gives you enough room to go bigger on the bore. They're also longer. So so you can tolerate a bigger stroke crank without the piston coming out of the bottom of the bore. We ever do diesel content. I won't ever run a diesel on the engine dyno. Why can turbo engines today have higher compression but older turbos had lower compression? They could have had higher compression than two. A couple of things that we have now is more understanding of what's going on that you don't need to have six and a half to one compression to run a turbo. Um, when Porsche did it, they also do with air cooled motors which have its own kind of problem. Uh, on a water cool deal we have but we have really good engine management systems and knock sensors that help us allow us to run combinations of boost and and um compression ratio static compression ratio and cam timing there are a lot of things that have helped us do that i did a vtr stage two and a dual spring trunnion upgrade and yes i accidentally revved it to 8140. <laughs> There's your answer. I, I've done plenty of diesel testing on the chassis dyno, but just not on the engine dyno. We won't, Westec won't run a diesel on the engine dyno. Uh, Randall, all of our blocks were solid or dry, methanol only. Yeah, that's because methanol keeps the, certainly keeps the thing cool. How long do the trays to keep the lifters in the right orientation last? Well, we've, like I said, we've taken apart um, wrecking yard motors that have a few hundred thousand miles on them and they were still good. We've also taken some apart <laughs> and not taken them apart and had them break. Not break, but you have the lifter rotate in them because they just wear out. They wear out from lots of cycle use, uh, lots of heat cycling. Um, they're in a terrible environment. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, you updated the tune and picked up boost. I, I don't normally see that happen. The sleeves in the, the Darton sleeves are longer than stock, yes. Uh, it's in a nutshell, it's due to late model engines using direct injection as opposed to port injection. That's 
that's not it. There are people doing that now, but we were doing higher compression and turbocharging um, and supercharging before the advent of direct injection with just port injection. Richard, would you change the LSA from air to from air to water air cooling to air to air? Would I would I change the camshaft to because I changed the intercooler? No. Why does the Ellis and Hemi use plastic lifter trays? Is there a solution for that? You link bar lifters are available, but it's not a it's not a problem that you have to solve because, like I said, if they last two or three hundred thousand miles, they're fine. And if you just buy twenty dollar new ones from the from the uh, dealership when you're putting your junkyard motor together, the problem is solved. They won't rotate in there because there's not a lot of load on them. It's just that they get sloppy. And if the if the things bounce around there and going, you know, it's cycling really, really fast, um, then, then you'll have a problem. But they don't have a problem normally. LS7 lifters are good. Have you seen the chill factor performance cool wrap? Works real good. I don't know what that is. Our old motors would not run on 20 degrees of timing either. Yeah, the Porsche rent knock sensors on their stuff, I thought. The only dental service here in Maui. So you're on Maui? That's awesome. Um, and they only do front wheel drives. I wonder why that is. Uh, Craig, I, I, I disagree with that universal thing um, that every 90 degree bend is worth is a is one PSI lost. If you look at the crazy stuff that we've run, we would have no boost. <laughs> have you heard of the Australian company that makes intercourse? I what you have to tell me what the name of it is. The intake cool wrap made 18 horsepower on a stock Mustang. I'd, I'd like to see that stuff, if the, I, but I, I would want to see what the charge temperature change is. What compression ratio do you recommend on E85 at 20 pounds? The 20 pounds thing is irrelevant. Um, you need to tell me what the rest of the combination is to determine what the static compression is. You, you can run 9 to 1 or 10 to 1 or 12 to 1, um, 13 to 1, 15 to 1. It depends on what, what you're trying to get done. Biggest tune change to raise the boost is retarding the intake M. Oh, so you're not talking about air fuel and timing. You're talking about cam timing changes. That makes more sense. I, I thought you were talking about changing the timing and changing the air fuel, and then that was changing the boost. And I was going to wonder how that happened. The turbo technology today, can you get a turbo to make the low end power close to a supercharger? You can get a turbo to make a lot more low end power than a centrifugal supercharger. Um, factory stuff has turbo applications that make peak power at 1800 RPM on a turbo application. So if you size the turbo, you can get it to do what you want. The problem is that there's always a trade off. If you have your, you know, maximum boost or whatever the, the wastegate is set at, and you have peak boost at 1800 RPM or peak torque there, you're going to limit power higher in the engine speed. And then there's always a trade off there as, as, as we try to want more, like if we want, we want that and we want a thousand horsepower, that's really hard to get. Yes, Kurt, there's a lot of wonderful things in Hawaii. 
Uh, Dean, I didn't notice you were talking too much. Are twin GT45 is too much for a Navigator 4 valve? Again, it just depends on how much power you want. It's going to be laggy on a, on a, a Navigator 4 valve because those turbos, those two turbos will make 14 or 1500 horsepower. Do, do you want that much? Chances are probably not, certainly not on a stock one. So you'd be better off picking smaller ones that are more responsive and that are going to give you how much ever you want. Like that's like a thousand horsepower, 800 or whatever. Richard, I've built air to water intercoolers in two ways, air flowing through the bars and water running through the bars. Usually I get a bit better cooling with water in the bars. That's interesting. Uh, nitrous Dan, yes, does help turbo lag <laughs> a lot. Garrett has the electric boost motor for the turbo now. Small turbos like the EcoBoost make great low end, but suck above 4,500. I, I don't think that the RPM thing is, I think that that's a function of the programming of the turbos. The turbos probably have more to offer, but most factory systems, if you have a restriction gauge, <laughs> boost gauge, um, you'll see that most of the factory uh, turbo motors have a falling boost curve, which is not wholly a function of the turbo sizing. Some of it has to do with that. And as you raise the boost, you'll see if you raise the boost and the whole boost curve goes up, but it's still falling, then you'll know, well, I could have had it be flatter and still carried that whatever that increase was, another pound or two or three or whatever it was. You could do that, but they they purposely do that. The thing feels like a big motor because that's what Americans like anyway. It feels like a big motor. And then they have it fall just enough to it has a kind of rising power curve. Uh, and then it, you know, then it tailors off. And, and this is especially the case in truck applications where you're not revving it very high anyway. If drag racing, just power braking, get the turbo up. Yeah, or two-stepping it or, you know, there are, there are ways to do that in drag racing. Would electric fans make a cooling difference on a boosted 5.3 or stock fan is okay? If you're not having any cooling problems, then I wouldn't worry about it. The, the factory cooling system on 5.3 trucks, with, because I have one, is seems to be seems to work fantastic. I've never had any cooling issues. Do long tube headers work with a turbo? Do you want manifolds? Either one of them will work. Just size the turbo for what you want to do, and both of those will work. BVT has a lot to do with low end torque on moderate engines. Yep, that works good. Would you like to run a quick spool valve for a divided T6 turbo housing? I'm going to order one from a company in England from a customer's car here, and I could change it to two. Um, I, quick spool valves are really for, I think that they're for drag racing guys that are using really big turbos on applications and trying to get it to spool. That's a pretty limited um, application for not the kind of thing that I test on the, and we don't really need to test that on the engine dyno. It'd be, that's much better tested at the track. Uh, Dean, the boost, we talked about boost controllers a little bit and boost controllers can help, but they help in in a range that's after the turbo has already spooled up. They don't if the if the gate is closed all the way and you don't have any controller on it and you don't have any wastegate on it, you just have a cap on it. Then the boost response is going to be a function of the turbo and the motor and the piping that you use and that stuff. And if, as long as you have heat in it and then you get the turbo to respond the way that it responds. A controller can't do any better than that. There's nothing that a controller can do to help make it better than that situation. 
So as long as the gate is closed, and that's all the controller is going to do, it's going to make the gate close. If the gate's already closed, the response rate is just a function of those other big important things. Where the where the wastegate controller helps is when you don't have one and you have a wastegate. Because the wastegate opens up just a little bit, you know, and, and it stops it from doing that, holds it closed, so it comes up, you know, all the way up faster and you get that little gains right before you get to the to the um the total opening area so it does those things but the problem is and this is my discussion early on is that people think that a wastegate controller electronic controller can make your turbo spool up faster <laughs> and like i said it doesn't do the other the others it's other big part stuff new to turbos i'm only running 10 psi no intercore do i really need one yes you do you, you can make more power. It'll be cooler. It'll be safer. You can run more timing. Um, all of that is a possible. My nephew saw a turbo Pontiac 301. Those are cool. Can you use compressed air? You mean to aim air at the impeller to spool it up? The guys at Turbo Magazine way back tried to use nitrous to do that. And what they found is that just adding nitrous to the motor <laughs> was, was much better at helping the spool rate. I believe that the ultimate turbo for for mile big block for big blocks like a Cadillac is the opposite of hybrid turbos made for high performance four cylinders, a larger turbine. Yes, but it, the thing about having a 500 inch motor is you you're, you're going to want to have a larger turbine, but you also can spool up that turbine can also spool up a fairly big compressor too. You can't have a <laughs> T4 hot side and a T3 cold side. That's not going to work very well on a 500 inch Cadillac because you're just going to be out of compressor. The two things actually need to be sized fairly well. Yeah, you can use compressor. Yeah, if you have enough compressor here, you can use that for all of the boost. Remote mount turbos like the STS are homemade. Is it and the turbo is uh, six to seven feet. Yes, an intercooler is always necessary. That length of tubing does very little to cool the charger. Three hundred one upgraded with a GT forty five or seventy eight seventy five. On a three hundred one, probably would want to start out at the GT forty five size and then then go to something bigger. Although maybe, may, although the 301s don't have a really good reputation in terms of power. Let's see how our poll is doing. Is the intercooler add power? 85% saying yes, 15% saying no. Those are the after cooler guys. A GT98, yeah. And and you should have twins on those, right? Because it's a V8, you got to have one on each side. Hit the like button, people. We're not even at 50%. Come on, guys. Yes, the chili bomb. I'm curious to see if the chili if the chili bomb will work well on the Nissan on the L28. Can you do a compound boost twin turbo screw blower down test? I've already done the compound boost with a roots blower and it does the same thing with a twin screw. It doesn't matter which one of those blowers that you use. In fact, I've done a, a I've done that a couple of times. We did it with the 3800 and I also did it with a with the guys from HP Performance with my buddy Jimmy and Nathan. We did it with uh, an 03 Cobra motor. Have you looked into inner chillers? I haven't done a test on one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was a, I'm before I ask that, I'm going to go look that up because that's why I had the internet. Pontiac 301 Turbo was rated at a whopping 210 horsepower, but 348 foot pounds of torque in 1980. 
the fact that it made 345 foot pounds of torque tells you that it should at least be able to make 345 horsepower. Yeah, Alan, I was there at West Tech when they were doing the compressor supercharger deal, and it, and it is amazing. And it's amazing that they were able to double the power output of the NA motor at only seven pounds of boost. So think about that. And that's that's one application where an intercooler is not necessary because <laughs> the compressor supercharger is already cold. In fact, the discharge temperature, I think, was below zero. Did you post a compound boost cover? I thought that I did, but somebody told me that it's not up. So I need to go look. I, I did a story for Muscle Mustangs way back. What are people running for twins on an 8.8? .8? An 8.8 .8 what? An 8.8 .8, um, like the big block? GM was bragging about Corvette horsepower in those days. I think it was at 200. What year was that, 1980? That would have been an L82 probably. So it was, um, I'll bet it was, um, I'm thinking that it was, I know the L82 made 230 on one of the versions. Hundred and ninety horsepower for the L forty eight and two hundred and thirty horsepower for the L eighty two. So if we think about that, we think about that L eighty two, uh taking back to Hundred and ninety horsepower on the L forty eight. That's right. Um, if we think about the L eighty two in the eighties, in the early eighties or late seventies, um, that made as much as a tune port motor did, which is impressive. Uh, were they using nitrogen? No, they're not using nitrogen. Is inert and it won't burn. They're using oxygen. They're using air, basically, they just compress air like a scuba tank, except they're big. And the valving on it is amazing. Yeah, yes, hit the like button, Dan. The air intake cooling wrap cools the air just as cold, if not colder, than an intercooler, and it's lighter than air. So it's an air intake. It's a cooling system that wraps around the air intake, and that cools the air in a tube. I'd, li I'd like to see that. I've done everything, mailing water pump, all that. Do I simply need a three quarter? You probably need a bigger radiator, or do you have a problem with a, a head gasket or something? Yeah, Alan, it was it was done at West Tech, and it was the guys that the guys that used to own NOS are the people that did it, um, Carl and Dale. The Australian company is forced induction. I think I'm getting behind here. Forced induction inner chillers. They use air conditioning system to cool the inner core. So that, that we know that that works. Have you ever heard of anyone doing a turbo AMC motor? I haven't seen one, but that doesn't, I'm sure it's been done. I mean, turbos go on everything. <laughs> An L82. An L82 was the, was the stuff. I have a video up on L82s. Uh, you did the fast uh, muscle Mustangs and fast forwards. I, I didn't do the Manhattan project. That was a Hellion kit. I didn't do that. We did one from HP performance. Removing the thermostat doesn't necessarily make cooling system better. No, it don't. It doesn't a lot of times. The gen seven, 8.8. .8, yeah. That's what I thought. People shame me thinking about 78, 75. You don't need for 1200 horsepower. You don't need twin 78, 75s. You, they can be smaller than that. Twin GT45s uh, on that motor would be fine for 1,200 horsepower. 
Um, twin 7875s are like 2,000 horsepower, and twin GT55s are like, I don't know, 3,000. The uh, L48 was rated at 180 horsepower. The California car might have been um, lower than that. It depends on the year. The one I looked at, I think, it was 1980. The Manhattan Project was the um, was the bomb. Yeah, the Corvettes had the shifters on. The guy at West Tech has a few Corvettes, and they have the little badges on the shift columns or on the down where the shifter is. Yeah, the L82 was a, the, the three that I did was I did the L46, the L82, and then the um, L79. So the L79 was the 350 horse 327, the L46 was the 350 horse 350, and then the L82 was basically the low compression version of that 350 horse 350. The Doug Nash, actually the guy from West Tech has a, um, I think it's a, 57 with a 427 big block in it <coughs> and a Doug Nash in it. <laughs> tall deck, big block Chevy, cylinder heads, any better than peanut port heads? I, I think I thought that the tall deck stuff was um, the was the oval ports, the standard oval ports. I could be wrong. I haven't seen a lot of those taken apart. Yeah, Randall. Lots of guys took the tri powers off. I had a sixty nine tri power four twenty seven. Um, and a lot of guys took those tri powers off just to put <laughs> regular four barrels on them. The, the Manhattan Project that somebody mentioned was the title of a magazine story <laughs> that they were doing um, turbos blowing into the Terminator supercharger. They did a Hellion kit, and then I did a different story with the guys from HP Performance, and they just named it that, and it's obviously named after the, the that, that's the project that they, that was the project name for the atomic bomb. So we will close out our poll. 86% it climbed a little bit. 86% saying yes, that intercooler does add power, and 14% saying no. We'll end our poll there. Anthony, yours will be the last question for tonight. Your opinion, a T3, T4 hybrid on a 256 AMC inline six going into a 72 international sized right. Only turning 4,500, not looking to make more than 320 horsepower. The T3, T4 hybrid doesn't tell me enough about the turbo. That can be hundreds of different turbos. <laughs> the fact that it has a T3 on one side and a T3 on the hot side and the T4 on the cold side, um, that only tells me that you have two different sides. I need to know how big the turbos are. I need to know if the hot side is a 57 millimeter or a 60 or a 46 or whatever it is. Um, then I can have a better idea. You, what you're looking for on a 258-inch inline six-cylinder, something like a GT3582 or a GT3076 is kind of what you should look for.
Kind of like the guys taking the mechanical fuel injection off Porsches and putting on a couple of Webers. Yep. A couple of triple throat Webers <laughs> for the Porsche. I think that my 72 911T had um, fuel injection on it, if I remember right. Uh, when does the Nova have to do burnouts? I have to look back and see what what was the date of that. I'll go look tonight and see what the date of that, um, the date that he picked it up. I think it's ready. I think it's I think it's almost ready. I talked to him again tonight. I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about taking a ride in it. I'm also very excited about the L28 turbo motor because it says turbo on the valve cover. It's a little things in life. Look at that. Yeah. Whoosh. Mustang. Vortec Mustang. Jet. Which one, which one of those do you think won? <laughs> uh, Matt. The, we normally do 408s out of them. I've seen guys do bigger than that, but I don't recommend putting a um, putting. I don't recommend going to a really big stroke. I don't like a 4100 or a 4125 stroke, and I also don't recommend going to a 4065 or a 4070 bore on those. Thanks, noodles. Those injection pumps could ever go for 10 grand. Nice. I should have kept all those parts on. Huh? By a jet. Yeah, that's, that's pretty pricey, though, I think. Okay, guys, I have to get going. Thank you all for showing up. I'm working on some cam videos right now, uh, comparing different stages of cams, different size cams, to show you little cams. Do they really make more torque? <laughs> that's really not it. <laughs> Thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you all tomorrow. Do 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 do.